All right, I'm going to call the uh, September 1, 2020 Judicial Public Safety Committee meeting to order. If you could take a roll call for attendance. Chairman Eckhoff? Here. Member Covert? Here. Here. Member DeCiani? Here. Member Elliott? Here. Member Healy? Member Kudruski? Here. Member Larson? Here. Member Noonan? Here. Member Puchelski? Here. Member Renahan? Here. Member Tornatore? Here. Member Zay? Here. All right, we have a quorum, but not a quorum in the room, so we're going to have to take roll calls on the, all the votes here. Right. Is there any public comment? No public, no public comment. No chairman's remarks. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the August 18, 2020? JP? So moved. Second. Second. One of those days. Uh, any questions, comments, corrections? Right now, all in favor say aye. 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 We gotta do a roll call. Member Noonan? Aye. Member Puchalski? Aye. Member Renahan? Aye. Member Tornatore? Aye. Member Zay? Aye. Chairman Eckhoff? Aye. Member Covert? Aye. Member Dutina? Aye. Member Elliott? Aye. Member Kudruski? Aye. Member Larson. Aye. It passes. Moving on to resolutions, is there a motion to approve JPS 484420, acceptance of the DCFS Children's Advocacy Center grant? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, if you can take roll call, starting with Mr. Zay. Member Zay. Aye. Chairman Nakoff? Aye. Member Covert? Aye. Member DeCiani? Aye. Member Elliott? Aye. Member Healy? Member Kudruski? Aye. Member Larson? Aye. Member Noonan? Aye. Member Puchalski? Aye. Member Renahan? Aye. Member Tornatore? Aye. All right, if we can combine agenda items seven and eight, which are both uh, informational. Uh, seven. Moved by Mr. Pachowski to combine and approve. Second. A 7A is a grant proposal from the Illinois Court Improvement Program. And 8A is information on the public defender's July 2020 monthly statistical report. It's been moved in second to combine and approve. We can have a roll call starting with Mr. Pachowski. Member Pachowski. Aye. Member Renahan. Aye. Member Tornatore? Aye. Member Zay? Aye. Chairman Eckhoff? Aye. Member Covert? Aye. Member DeCiani? Aye. Member Elliott? Aye. Member Kudruski? Aye. Member Larson? Aye. Member Noonan? Aye. That passes. Now the uh, items that you've all been for. We have our budget presentations today, first from the 18th Judicial Circuit, Chief Judge Dan Guerin, present, Administrative Assistant Suzanne Armstrong. Uh, probably come up to the podium here. Uh, I think you you sent copies of your presentation. Uh, they're gonna make copies and distribute them. I know they're on. Yeah, <laughs> oh, well, I I read mine and it's all it's all up here. All upstairs. All right. Well, thank you, Chief Judge, for being here today. Appreciate your time. Uh, in your presentation. So 
when thank you're you. ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank the uh, members of the committee for the opportunity to present our um, fiscal year 2021 budget uh, requests. We did previously send the uh, budget summary sheet and uh, spreadsheets, I believe, eventually got to everybody. So um, regarding the budgets, uh, just the next slide. Um, 18th Judicial Circuit is responsible for seven uh, budgets. So four are supported with general county funds, uh, one from the property tax levy and two are fee funded. Uh, next slide. The percentages of the budget breakdown, uh, as you can see, and not surprisingly, the probation department uh, takes up the majority of uh, the budget about 61%. Circuit Court uh, is next at around 13, and the other budgets uh, fairly evenly spread out at lower percentages. Next slide. Our budget summary, uh, as you can see there, reflects an overall reduction from fiscal year 2020 of $125,072. So uh, we have reduced the budgets in the Circuit Court by $36,776, the jury commission by $70,448, and the law library by $17,848. The other budgets uh, remain uh, flat. And uh, I do want to note, just as a kind of overall for the uh, 18th Judicial Circuit, the last three years, fiscal year 2019, uh, we came in uh, requesting an overall reduction of $106,465 from 2018. So we had a reduction request that year. That was also the year, I believe it was about the fifth straight year that the state gave no additional money for the judiciary. Um, they only reimbursed the county at about 70%. And because it was so low, uh, for the first time, I invoked a statutory formula uh, that allowed us uh, in cooperation with the administrative office to seek monies from the probation fee fund to be dispersed to the county to help with the budget shortfall. So fiscal year 2019, we did disperse $1,243,234 to the county from our probation fee fund to help with that shortfall. Uh, fiscal year 2020, we also came in reducing our budgets. Four out of seven budgets were reduced. Uh, the juvenile transport budget had to go up a little bit because there were some more uh, minors detained that year. Uh, and uh, the probation budget reflected an increase because the drug court and my cap budgets were folded into it. But uh, the good news that year was the state finally reimbursed the way they were supposed to under the statute at, for all the probation positions according to the statute uh, to help the county that year. And so this year, uh, 2021, again, as I said, we have an overall reduction of $125,072. Now, additionally to that, some good news is that our director of probation uh, has worked with the administrative office very closely and uh, has uh, submitted the paperwork uh, and went through the steps to get the administrative office to increase the reimbursement um, this year for 15 spots. Uh, usually only reimbursed at about $12,000. Now they're reimbursed at 100%. Um, that additional reimbursement that the director of probation worked hard to achieve uh, amounts to $568,371 in additional reimbursement now that the county will get from the state for 15 more spots. So uh, for the last three years, uh, basically, we have found a way to make available to the county over $1.8 million for your budget needs uh, when you look at those two things combined. Um, we've been careful stewards of the tax meter money. Uh, we've achieved more uh, with less, uh, and we've supported the county needs when necessary, but we have also, uh, no question, benefited from the county board's efforts uh, to support a fair, efficient, and effective justice system. So we uh, greatly appreciate that. Uh, the next slide, uh, as far as the circuit court budget itself, um, as I said, it's a decrease of over $36,000, mainly the way we achieved it. We had a secretary supervisor position uh, when I came in, uh, together with Suzanne Armstrong, the trial court administrator, we reviewed everything top to bottom. Um, and it was determined uh, that the presiding judges should take a greater role 
along with the principal secretaries of managing and supervising and evaluating the secretaries uh, on more on a day-to-day -day basis. And the secretary supervisor position was not uh, necessary with the presiding judges taking a greater role. So but we were able to reduce it uh, by over 20, about $22,602 in overall salaries uh, because of that move. Um, and there are some other reductions uh, that you can see from the uh, summary of lesser amounts, but it, it amounts to that $36,776 decrease. There are certain achievements uh, that have been uh, performed under the circuit court staff under this budget, essentially, uh, that I do want to mention. That's the next slide. Um, one is the Family Violence Coordinating Council. This is operating under a state grant, but uh, judges preside over this council. Uh, it was uh, resurrected when I first came in as chief. It had not been uh, carried on for the last few years before that, but we sought the grant again. So there's judges, attorneys, law enforcement, probation, health department, social workers, all part of this uh, council. And they have performed uh, very important tasks uh, since we started it again. They've done a roll call video for the police departments on domestic violence protocol. They did court personnel training uh, with about 49 or 50 participants. So that's people in the courthouse who encounter domestic violence issues and questions and how to respond and how to handle it. They did a domestic violence arrest protocol for the uh, people with disabilities and the elderly and how to uh, handle those situations. They presented a vicarious trauma in the work environment. They had over 400 people in attendance at that and had a professional speaker talk about that. And a talking about stalking uh, presentation that they did with Benedictine University uh, with 100 or more participants in that. Uh, judges also provide, presided over the uh, FOID firearm committee, subcommittee. When we had all those workplace shootings, uh, we noticed that there were some gaps in things like our probation orders and bond court orders where it wasn't clear how somebody was supposed to turn over a firearm or what the uh, procedure should be. And so we formed a subcommittee, which is still going, working with law enforcement to shore up any gaps in how we handle uh, firearm surrender. The specialty and juvenile courts division, um, there was a great importance by the Illinois Supreme Court, great importance placed on problem solving courts. So drug court, mental health, uh, veterans court, and the growth in those courts, uh, together with the unique challenges that we have in juvenile court, uh, we formed a new division uh, because before, um, there are three different presiding judges and three different divisions trying to monitor what we were doing in these courts. They share restorative uh, justice principles. They share similar training and education between problem solving courts and juvenile courts. So we have made one division presided by one judge uh, to bring uniformity to that. Uh, the immediate effect was when Kane County had to shut down their youth home because of COVID, um, we had to figure out what to do with the detainees. And this presiding judge in this new division uh, worked with probation very, very closely and we were able to get Will County to take them uh, and arrange that whole procedure that you have to go through to, to shift detainees from one county to another. So it already uh, showed benefits by being much more organized. The domestic relations courtroom, the volume, length, and nature of those cases uh, required us opening another courtroom. We used the empty former juvenile courtroom. Uh, granted, it's very small. It used to be a juvenile courtroom. Uh, when the Supreme Court changed the way uh, of the rules of transporting juveniles, we couldn't use it anymore because you couldn't transport juveniles past uh, hallways and past adults. So it kind of was dying on the vine there. It was empty. Uh, but we placed a domestic relations courtroom in it, uh, giving us nine uh, divorce courtrooms to handle that heavy uh, and volume and the nature of those cases, cases. There's no additional money as a result of that clerk's office and the sheriff's office were able to cover it uh, without any additional hires. The traffic court uh, duties, um, the judges are on duty uh, on a rotation uh, every night, every weekend, and every holiday. Uh, 
for warrants, orders of protection, and so forth. Every weekend and every holiday, they hold bond court and juvenile detention hearings. But the judges also handle all electronic law enforcement requests, arrest warrants, search warrants, inventory returns, and eavesdrops. Uh, you can go to the next slide. This has uh, really grown because when they brought arrest warrants online, um, there is a huge amount of uh, work to do uh, to process these. And these take time. You can't just sign a search warrant or an eavesdrop quickly, obviously. So those are the numbers uh, on average that we have of these types of things. Um, what we've done is restructure traffic court a little bit. So the traffic court judges now assist the duty judge with this heavy volume of electronic requests. So they are available to review these. They also, the traffic judges now handle compliance calls. Uh, I moved them into the traffic courts. They used to be in the order protection courtroom. They don't belong in the order protection courtroom. Uh, they were thrown in there years ago because there's nowhere else to put them. But traffic judges now handle these. So the state's attorney seeking judgments on old uh, tickets, uh, child support enforcement fees, wage deduction proceedings, those are now handled by the traffic court judges and out of the order protection room. Uh, they also are now assisting much more with the legal research because we're down to one staff attorney. Um, they've had to research search warrant law and Zoom legal waivers for me already. And uh, so their time now, uh, not on the bench, but in the chambers doing these things uh, has helped out the, the circuit very much. And uh, the next slide, uh, as far as the, yeah, the next slide. The Arts Commission that we formed in the 18th Judicial Circuit, um, the idea was to have the courthouse reflect the ideals and the principles and values of the American justice system. Before, this main hallway um, was just kind of thrown together with, if, if somebody got something and you had to hang it up, we hung it up on the first floor and there was no coherency to it whatsoever. Uh, facilities did a remarkable job cleaning it all up. The Arts Commission looked for works of art that represent those ideals and principles. Uh, it was named after uh, our trial court administrator, our colleague John Lipinski. It was yesterday uh, was the anniversary of his death. Um, but uh, this is how it looks uh, now. There's thousands of people that go through this hallway every year, jurors, the weddings, all the traffic court people, all the employees from the state's attorney and the public defender and so forth go through this main corridor. Uh, so there are framed prints now of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, Gettysburg Address, uh, Martin Luther King quotes, uh, the history of the courthouses over the years, uh, the first women DuPage attorneys, things like that now adorn the walls. People have made many comments about it and uh, feel that it really uh, made the courthouse look uh, much better. We also did a high school art competition. So on the next slide, the high school uh, people, oh, that's Lady Justice entering it. That's okay, go ahead. And um, we have uh, hung up their, their works of art, the winners from the high school arts competition. Next slide. Uh, COVID-19 obviously impacted uh, us, or as it has everybody. Um, and we had to uh, quickly and completely restructure and redesign how the court calls are conducted. Uh, and trying to ensure access to justice and safeguard the health and safety of the employees, the attorneys, and the public. So you understand, we have to operate under Illinois Supreme Court orders. And they started coming out in March of this year, telling the circuit courts how we are supposed to operate. The first thing was, they told us to conduct essential court matters in person, non-essential, remotely if we could. Uh, they, Speedy trial terms were told because we couldn't do juries. Uh, so we took a gradual measured approach to reopening. We were always open. We never shut the courthouse. The essential matters were in custody cases, orders of protection, bond court, summary suspensions, emergency matters. Those were all conducted from the very beginning. At the same time, we had to figure out remote so we started with Zoom procedures in civil divisions in May, and they're still doing that now. That was quite an undertaking, but uh, they've all smoothed it out and it's going very well in all the civil divisions. The criminal divisions and juvenile, 
we slowly expanded in June to bring in more cases, essential and so, so to speak, non-essential. Um, and then we began Zoom in criminal August 24th, with some exceptions. Uh, and so now the courthouse, uh, most of it is being conducted through Zoom. There are things that you have to do in person, orders of protection, obviously trials, evidentiary hearings, things like that, guilty pleas, we do in person. Uh, but the others have cleared out the courthouse and kept it, the numbers down. Uh, the health and safety measures that we've taken, uh, if you've been over there, you've noticed we have thermal temperature screening at the entrance, uh, face covering mandates, plexiglass, plexiglass shields are throughout the public spaces and the courtrooms. We had to reconfigure the spaces in the courtrooms in the public spaces for social distancing. Hand sanitizer stations are throughout. And one of the big things we did were remote bail hearings. We started very early. So we saw that Cook County had people on DuPage warrants, that they had them down in Cook County Jail. Sometimes they were COVID symptoms. Uh, there were issues about transporting these people to the DuPage Jail, putting them in our jail to have a bond hearing. So we arranged to have these bail hearings remotely, the state's attorney, the public defender, the judge, uh, and Cook County was remarkable in helping us with this. Uh, we, we also did it through, from police stations in DuPage. If the officers had somebody like this that they didn't want to bring into the jail, uh, we did it from there. So we have kept people with those types of either COVID positive or symptoms out of the jail as much as we could. Um, I forget how many we've done. I want to say, I, probably should, I think it's around 12 or 15 of these remote bail hearings. Um, which, just for clarification, there was uh, my recent administrative order outlined Zoom for the criminal divisions. In the order, it has inmates who don't want to waive their appearance. We bring them over in person at 11 o'clock or 1.30. Uh, that administrative order, just for clarity, never mandated or required inmates appear by Zoom. Realized this jail didn't have the capability. So the administrative order said bring them over in person if you need them. Now it's a fact that would greatly benefit the jail to have the means to allow Zoom proceedings for inmates. Uh, other counties do it. Um, I think the state's attorney, the public defender, the sheriff, myself, we agree Zoom for inmates is very beneficial, but uh, I, I never requested it or I never ordered it. Uh, and I sent that administrative order to the county board on August 18th. Uh, there may have been some confusion on it, the way it was presented, but that, that's uh, what that order said and didn't say. Uh, the self-represented litigants, it's one of our biggest challenges. We have self-help stations in the law library. We expanded them to nine Zoom stations, and we have staff present every day to help those people. And three Zoom stations in the uh, arbitration area for the municipal prosecutors, so they can be hooked up with the a duck system uh, sending the electronic orders and be able to conduct their calls via Zoom as well. Addison Traffic Court, I think there's a slide for that. Yeah, so uh, we were suddenly and unexpectedly informed that we're not, uh, that Addison won't, was no longer available to us in May. So we had to improvise a courtroom. Uh, it's in the annex meeting rooms on the first floor. Those are usually meeting rooms. Uh, we had to send multiple notices out, build a bench, a sound system, create some court time so that we didn't have all three traffic courts uh, in the same hallway. Uh, it's meant to be a short-term emergency measure. Uh, I would ask, I think we'll probably have a broader discussion at a later time about this traffic court, but um, you know, I tried to show what it's like. It's obviously a very long, narrow room uh, when you get up to the bench there, it's, it's crowded uh, with, with the defense attorney or the prosecutors or the people up there. It gets, um, it gets tight up there. So it's not ideal, but it's something that we had to put together. It's working okay right now, but uh, I think something must be done about that shortly. Uh, due to COVID-19, uh, I had to cap all the traffic calls at 80 initially, figuring in a, the usual failure to appear rate and things. These are some of our bigger courtrooms, the other traffic courtrooms. It has about 32 seats in it when you socially distance both of those. It worked okay because 80 with failure to report rates, generally we had 
40, 45 people showing up and we could work them in if it was going all right. Um, the problem was the police, not the problem, but the reality was the police started writing again, um, you know, in April and May and things. So the, the number of cases shot up. I was having 100, 110, 120 cases on these traffic calls because of the new tickets. So I had to cut it back again to cap it at 50, uh, taking into account the new tickets that are gonna be written. Our next project is to zoom traffic. There, there's a lot of issues with that. I've talked to other counties. Uh, we're working on it with the clerk. Some counties have people going to traffic court and sitting on a zoom for four hours. Uh, and uh, I'm not exactly sure yet why that's so much different than other, but I think it's the, there's a high pro se population, obviously in traffic court. There's a lot of issues there. I don't want people sitting for four hours on a traffic call. So we're working on that. It's probably our next uh, thing that we're going to uh, look at. As far as any uh, walk back scenarios, um, I know that the county board asked us to take a look at our budgets, um, 10, 20, and 30% uh, cuts. And it, for the circuit court budget, it's mainly uh, employees, you know, staff. So 10%, um, three, three full-time positions and one part-time position would probably have to be eliminated. Um, if you're looking at an IT position, the staff attorney, a secretary. Uh, if it was 20%, uh, uh, that would uh, occur. There'd probably have to be a furlough of staff um, for about 11 pay periods. And 70, a 30% uh, cut would be, uh, I don't think we could operate uh, at that level of a cut. So uh, the next slide, jury commission. Uh, as far as that budget's concerned, again, that's a cut once again. That was achieved because the dep there was a position of deputy court administrator that we took a look at when we reviewed all these positions and decided we could have some of those duties um, completed by other people on our staff. And they didn't have to all be in this one person with that high of a salary. So uh, it's now a, a jury commission supervisor, I think we call it, but it's, it's filled at a, at a lower salary level than a deputy court administrator. Uh, we disperse some of those duties and responsibilities to other people. And also cut, um, uh, filled other, uh, other uh, vacancies at lower salaries and filled one full-time with a part-time. So we kind of took a look at the whole jury commission structure and revised it to, to achieve those uh, savings. We have same day juror pay. We have updated screens in the jury commission um, uh, that uh, help with the orientation and the notification, the viewing when you're down there. Um, mainly the jury commission has been focused on the jury trials because of COVID. So next screen. Uh, we had to do a, a number of things. We, we, uh, made an insert for the jury summonses to tell the potential jurors all the steps we've taken to make them safe for COVID. Um, then we had to redesign the courtrooms. Our courtrooms could not handle jury trials, uh, a 12 person jury trial, not big enough. Uh, so uh, we looked at courtroom 4000 and 4002, two of our biggest courtrooms in the fourth floor in the criminal division. We focused on criminal because we had a un uh, unblock all these people who are in custody, have been there for a while. So uh, we worked with Mark Thomas and facilities who quite frankly are remarkable. Um, and they redesigned the courtrooms. So I think the next slide, maybe we can show, that's a regular jury box uh, that you'll find in our courthouses. You can see how it's structured with, with uh, six foot distancing, we, we couldn't do it. So go to the next slide. This is uh, the jury box that uh, facilities now has built for quorum 4000. It's a t combination of 12 person jury and two alternates. Um, and they're spread out as you can see, next slide. Uh, and that's the courtroom. You can tell there the plexiglass that's been installed for the witness box, the court reporter, the judge, the clerk. Uh, next slide. Uh, and I think that's just a close up of that. And that's how many of our courtrooms look now with the plexiglass installed. Next one. The jury deliberation room was the other problem uh, that we had. You couldn't put the jurors in there to deliberate. The jury deliberation rooms, this is a normal one, are just too small. So we had to take a, an old um, 
library room up on the fourth floor and it was now a break room, it was a break room. I had to clear it all out and put a deliberation room in there. So I think we have a slide of it. That's the deliberation room for 12 jurors spaced apart. Uh, and it works well. Um, we've already had uh, two juries criminal start. Um, they started July 20th, civil begins the first uh, of next year, but we had an aggravated battery and a reckless homicide trial. We had surveys conducted. Uh, the jurors had overwhelmingly positive responses on how everything was structured and done. Uh, so uh, as far as the numbers on the next slide, you can see these are our averages of the juries that we do. You can see why we're backed up here in 2020, uh, having only been able to do 18. But now things are starting to flow with these, uh, these jury rooms that have been constructed. We also run a grand jury, of course. Next slide. And uh, the grand jury is held there in one of the ROE rooms. Um, we had to combine the grand jury, the Tuesday, Thursday grand jury, into just one Thursday because we couldn't get enough people when COVID first hit. After that, May 21st and August 20th, we've called in jurors for the grand jury. It's gone very well, a much better response. The state's attorney has asked me to go back to having a Tuesday grand jury as well, because he's getting backed up with his presentations. I've granted that. So we'll have two grand juries going soon. Um, and the grand jurors like this setup. They are spaced apart and it works, it works well. The COVID courtroom, so to speak, on the third floor is being built. Uh, that's for civil and criminal juries. It'll be already spaced out appropriately. So uh, Darlene Rossetti in the uh, regional office, uh, we owe a great deal of thanks for letting us use these uh, rooms and letting us uh, uh, configure our juries in there. It's much appreciated. I also wanna thank the county board because the COVID courtroom that's being constructed is because uh, of the county board uh, allocating the funds and it's going to be something that is uh, much needed to get these civil med mail trials going. Uh, they're usually 12 persons and they're usually a lot of attorneys. So you need a lot of room. Um, the weddings, we halted in March. We resumed them in June. We do them by appointment only. Seven couples, four guests, uh, Thursday and Friday and each day of a non-jury week. So we've done about 170 uh, juries from June through August now. If we had to walk back um, the jury commission budget, uh, the 10% cut, um, we'd have to reduce the number of jurors scheduled by about 1,800 or so uh, to achieve savings there. They also told me, and this may be more important, we'd have to cancel coffee service. Um, I think that saves $16,000 or so. And that, you don't wanna do that, trust me. Um, 20% uh, cut is the same type of cuts, but we'd also have to have no Tuesday grand jury. Uh, and uh, further cuts um, would greatly, it would just impact the jury commission so much. Uh, we would be running uh, on fumes at that point. Um, the DUI evaluations budget, next screen, there's not a whole lot. It's flat um, from last year. Um, they have done 2,572 evaluations, They're $225 they cost. They're about two hours long. Uh, there's a 98% satisfaction rate. They call client satisfaction rate about the, how the evaluators do these. And the courts rely on these evaluations for consistency and professionalism. Uh, the Illinois Supreme Court mandates interpreters for these types of court annexed proceedings, they call them. So that's why there's a, there's an expense there for interpreters, but uh, essentially it's flat again, no great increase there of, of any kind. Probation, next slide. Um, you can go to the next one and the next one. The biggest uh, thing with probation, as I just alluded to, was this administrative office converting 15 positions that were subsidized at 12,000 a year to 100% subsidized. And, uh, $568,371. So that is a huge uh, difference and a huge uh, additional reimbursement. Uh, and thank the director for working with the AOIC so closely to get that done. The biggest thing we accomplished was drug court certification by the Illinois Supreme Court. 
this is no easy task. Uh, it took all of three years from when I first got in. It was one of my goals. Uh, the Illinois Supreme Court really puts you through the ringer to make sure your drug court is operating on evidence-based practices and doing it right. Multiple site visits, document and protocol review, interviews with staff. Um, they certified us this year. Uh, a lot of circuits are trying to get certified and we are now uh, certified. It was a great accomplishment uh, by everybody involved in drug court. Uh, next slide. So drug court, um, those are the numbers from 2018 and 2019. Uh, you have to remember it is a, a rigorous program that the people must go through in order to uh, successfully complete it. Um, next slide. Uh, mental illness court um, alternative program uh, has also been uh, operating very well. And um, those are the numbers that are reflected as far as eligible, accepted, and graduated. Next one. Our focus court, which is first offender call unified for success for first time uh, felony drug offenders. Four dedicated probation officers, 281 people are on probation as of July 28th. Just about uh, almost a 90% uh, remain arrest free. Um, it's been a, a tremendous success and has really helped people who first get caught up in the system to get the counseling and the direction that they need and not wait too long before they end up in drug court or worse in the penitentiary. Uh, next slide. So this is, um, these are the numbers for focus and uh, I, I believe the bottom chart shows this year 50 high risk, 152 medium risk, 75 low. But these are first offenders already at high risk and medium risk levels as they're coming into the system. Next one is Veterans Court. Uh, veterans Court, um, the case law expanded who can get into Veterans Court recently. They've expanded it into many more offenses, including DUIs. So we have expanded. Um, there's 15 current people in Veterans Court. I expect it to grow more now that the courts have ruled uh, on, on who can be admitted and who can be eligible. One thing I want to point out, the court staffing of these cases and the contact with the probationers never stopped, never stopped. The judges used remote, in-person when they had to. Probation did as well. We've had contact with all these people in these specialty courts during COVID. Next slide just simply shows some of the things probation does uh, as far as supervising adults and juveniles and the community service clients. You can see the numbers there uh, through the last three years. And uh, the next slide. Uh, COVID, um, we increased site visits, remote technology, and electronic monitoring increased. COVID and the Bail Reform Act. A lot of defendants are now on GPS or SCRAM devices as condition of bond. That falls on the probation department uh, to get them uh, monitored. Um, I think we have a next slide to show the numbers on that. So, um, as you can see, uh, GPS and SCRAM are up uh, and probation has done a tremendous job in trying to uh, stay on top of this issue and get uh, everyone uh, monitored appropriately. We've also worked with probation so that these cases are now brought before the judge more often for review. So somebody's not on a SCRAM alcohol bracelet for a year or two judges review it, see how they're doing, and we'll take them off if it's, if it's appropriate. Uh, the walk back scenario on probation, um, I think um, I know I had it here somewhere. Um, a 10 percent cut, uh, I've been told would eliminate 23 positions. Uh, Six of 14 pretrial officers, um, their caseload, the pretrial caseload would go way higher than is recommended. Um, and uh, the electronic monitoring and victim protection would suffer. Uh, drug testing capabilities would be reduced by 40%. If there's a 20% cut, similar, more people would uh, be eliminated up to 41. And drug testing would be reduced by 60%. 30% cut, probation 
couldn't function in any kind of significant manner. Uh, juvenile transport budget. Um, again, you saw that was cut. Um, it's better name is the juvenile detention screening and transport unit because really what they do mainly is screen juveniles to see if they have to be detained. So I think we have a screen. That's the number of screenings they conduct. Uh, next slide shows how many juveniles we have detained at the King County Youth Home uh, on average. Uh, and that's how we have to budget. So those years were nine, we budgeted for 11 uh, for 2020. We're projecting 12 for 2021. There's just been an uptick in juveniles committing violent crimes. So I think the next slide shows uh, some of the charges that the juveniles are currently in the youth home for. Uh, attempt murder and aggravated criminal sexual assault, residential burglary, firearm offenses. And uh, we have been experiencing increased uh, serious and violent crime. So uh, those are some of the offenses over the past year that we've dealt with. Juveniles are in there longer, uh, charged as adults eventually sometimes, but it takes a while for that to happen. So they're in the youth home for longer periods of time. Um, I'm sorry, the juvenile transport budget, I think I said it reduced, it's flat. And the reason it's still flat, even though we're projecting more juveniles is $45,900 savings came from eliminating a contracted psychiatrist we had because we just used the Kane County psychiatrist. That's where they are. We figured out, I don't, we just determined we might as well use the people they have over there and not have an additional one over here. So that uh, saved us money. Um, what happened with COVID-19, as I said, Kane County got shut down. Uh, we had to transfer new detainees to Will and we had to keep the people who are already at Kane because we can't move them out of there and move them around. So right now we have five at Will and two at Kane. It costs $135 uh, a day uh, for Kane. It's only, it's 140 for Will. So um, we had to do that once before when Kane County went on strike. Uh, the law library budget uh, was decreased yet again. I would say that fiscal year 19, we decreased it by over $13,000. Fiscal year 20, we decreased it by 50,000. And this year we've decreased it by 17,848. Um, we keep looking at print materials and how we can tighten it up, you know, what we can do electronically. And that, that really accounts for a lot of the decrease. Uh, the library personnel worked remotely the entire time during COVID. Uh, filling uh, the public and the attorney needs. Uh, they also expanded the self-help centers to include nine Zoom stations now that we're Zooming so much more. So a lot of pro se people come down there the Zoom. I think we have some photographs of the self-help centers. There's six, uh, six stations in that room and then the next photograph shows we've expanded there along that wall for nine more so they can Zoom. I've been down there every morning since we started Zooming in criminal. It's gone extremely well. Uh, the people are very adept at it. Um, and they get into their courtroom and have their case handled and uh, leave uh, the courthouse. So um, probation fees, I don't really have a lot to say on that that's the same. Uh, we haven't done any changes. We've moved everything we possibly can from the probation department budget to the probation fee budget. So there's really no room to move anything else. You have to be careful by statute what you put in the probation fee budget, uh, but it remains the same, uh, uh, no, no change there. So I believe that's, that's all. I'd be happy to uh, try to answer any of your questions. My staff is here, probably will have to answer some. Mr. Larson. Uh, thank you. Just a couple things. First of all, thank you for the work that you and your uh, judges do. I practice in many of the counties around the area, and as always, DuPage County leads the, the field, so to speak, in terms of the quality of the, the work done by the judges and the way they interact with the attorneys and, and uh, parties that appear before them. I can tell you what's going on in Cook County right now is just chaotic. It's absolutely chaotic. We get different orders every day, trying to figure out what sort of schedule they're trying to provide, whereas the judges in DuPage County, we at least know what we're doing. I think you said you anticipate civil trials beginning right. in January? Yes. At this point? Okay. That's, that's a good development. Um, 
The one thing on the budget uh, question that I would have, by the way, Cook County said maybe May or June before they started having jury trials is what we're being told. Um, the budget that we received was actually uh, an increase and, and what you presented is a little bit of a decrease from the circuit court. And I think it relates to a $200,000 line item and I don't know what that is because that was removed and that's. Uh, I believe that's the domestic uh, relations um, fund. So the domestic relations legal fund is by statute and it's uh, civil filing fees provide the money for that. Uh, I think it was an accounting situation where the uh, finance department told us that this, this has to be linked to some sort of budget, just put it someplace, but really there's no, that's all funded uh, per statute by filing fees. And uh, so it doesn't come out of general revenue. No, it does not come out of general revenue. It just had to be placed somewhere. And that's why it's reflected. Okay. And so then the overall the circuit court uh, jury commission and everything else that are funded by general revenue funds are actually a decrease of around $215,000 over last year. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Pachowski yeah. and Mr. Allen. The that we're building are, are, are going to be in, in use in 2021. Do you foresee any charge changes in 2021 as far as the COVID instructions? Well, the, uh, the COVID courtroom that, that we're building. Is that somebody who's tested positive? I don't want to focus. Well, I'm calling it that. I'm so, I, I, it's a shorthand, but um, we're building a quorum, so it's already the jury box is already distanced, oh, okay. and the council tables are already. We've already figured out how to do it, and so that's what the county board graciously allowed us to build with the COVID money. I'm calling it the COVID quorum. It'll be on the third floor. We're we're uh, the Adult Protective Services was. Or yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. we had the sheriff do a presentation, and crime was up 30, 40 percent on every case. You know, I, I try to take a look at those case filing numbers that the clerk sends out. Um, I, I haven't seen that oh, great of an issue. It's pretty, it's pretty steady, I would say, from what I could see. Uh, just anecdotally, you know, I go up, I see the order protection courtroom, a lot of people up there. Now, I, I think that's gone up or maybe uh, uh, that the cases are getting a little more complicated. Uh, but there's a lot of activity there in the order protection courtroom, I've noticed, um, and juvenile as well. Thank you. Mr. Elliott. I didn't have a question. Oh, sorry, I thought I saw you raise your hand. All right, anyone else? Well, thank you, Judge, for coming in. I know you and your staff have worked a lot of hours to uh, continue to deliver uh, court services over the last few months. So we appreciate and look forward to working with you in the future. All right, thank you. All right, we've got a few minutes left for OEM. I know Public Works is starting at nine o'clock. If we run a couple minutes over, maybe they can hold on. Mr. Healy's on a different Zoom. And Mr. Snow's got OEM. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak with you. I'd like to take just one minute to introduce my, uh, my management staff. Security Chief Keith Briggs. At the back there in the baby blue bandana is Mr. Corey Mo Ryan, my, my support section supervisor, and Ms. Callie Thomas, my operations section supervisor. Now, everybody has received a copy of the slideshow, uh, the slide deck. So if you have any questions about that as we go forward, uh, please ask or email me, we'll be happy to get those answers to you. But to preserve your time, we would like to go specifically to the budget numbers. So Wendy, if we could go to slide six. There we go. Uh, this is the security budget, highlighting a couple lines. Uh, the reductions that uh, Chief Briggs was able to make in furniture and machinery, 10,000. That number is the tort liability that was put into that account last year. I'll have to defer to the finance as to why that happened, but that's where that money comes from. The $70,000 on other professional services, 
when we originally went out to bid for the security contract, we were under the impression with all the information we had that it would be at least a 10 to 12% increase on that budget. So we estimated approximately 970,000 for three year contract with one year extension. That budget came back or that estimate came back and Allied Security was awarded the contract at approximately $890,000. So we were able to take that money back. Now, other than Allied Security, the next biggest part of the security budget is salaries. Uh, next slide, Wendy. Thank you. Regular salaries, we, Chief Briggs is able to come in with a 0% increase. And the total budget, because of the two reductions he was able to make, the 2021 requested budget comes in at $1.28 million a 3.1% reduction in the overall security budget. All right. Now, if we could move to, where are we? All right, slide 18, please, Wendy. <clears throat> now you've all got a very large sheet of paper, four pages that uh, one more, a few more actually. Next, next, next. <laughs> Here we go. You've got a large sheet of paper to make the numbers a little bit bigger, a little easier to read. That is the printout from finance, but I will draw your attention to the next slide, please. The OEM budget is approximately 95% salary. So any cuts we make are going to be minor, but we were able to find some money, operating supplies for $8,000, furniture machinery another thousand, and we knocked 40% off our dues and membership. $9,400, it's not a lot, but we don't have a lot of wiggle room with extraneous cuts. Now, next slide, please. All right, last year, our regular salaries we had $700,059 from the general fund. This year, because of the COLA last year, we are asking for 726,504. That is a 3.8% 3 increase, but it is due to that COLA number. Overall, our budget goes up approximately $22,000. We're asking for $858,404 a 2.6% increase over last year, All right? If we could just go to the next slide, just for one minute, please. Back in 2013, Gary Manier, the mayor of Washington, Illinois, uh, his, his town was pretty much decimated by a, a, a tornado. And this quote that we pulled out of the newspaper that he gave in an interview basically sums up what emergency management is. We play what if games. What if that tornado hits here? What do we do? How do we operate? How do we pull in other services? And as Gary said, you look at those plans once in a while, you put them on the bookshelf, but when you need them, they're there. And that's, that's what our department does. We put those plans together with other departments at the county, at the municipal, at the state, and at the federal level. So a uh, very brief overview of our budget. It's a very small budget, comparatively speaking. I believe the common phrase in DuPage is that it's, it's uh, not even worth a change order for stormwater management or public works. But no, that, I, I'm not the first one to say that this year. But if there are any questions, uh, we'll take them now. Any questions, Mr. Larson? Uh, Yes, so I'm trying to figure out on the, the salaries line. I'm looking historically, the numbers the last several years have been in the mid to upper 600,000s. Uh, the anticipated final year end for 2020 is gonna be 644, 687. Last year's budget was 700,000, even though it had been around 650 to 670 actual expenditures over the last seven years. And you're putting in a 3.8% increase which is, you know, we, even the COLAs we've given are only 2%. So that, that would actually be $80,000 more than, than we're anticipated to spend this year, which would be like a 12% increase over actual for this year. So, so where did that, 
uh, budget requests come from for the salary? Well, the salary line, like I say, is 26,000 more than it was last year. And after speaking with finance and walking through everything, that 26 is pretty much assigned to the COLA, or that's where that increase came from. Now, our actual salary line is just about $1 million, but we have the agreement with the DuPage County Health Department. They provide, uh, this year they're providing three hundred and just about $320,000. 3.5 FTE came across in 2016 with that agreement. The money that we get from the grants from the health department goes towards the general fund to offset our salaries. So our salary line is actually about a million six thousand. That three hundred thousand, three hundred twenty thousand dollars this year offsets our salary line to about seven hundred and this year seven hundred twenty-six thousand. I mean, I understand the arrangement and, and board help too. It just doesn't. I'm, I'm, the numbers aren't making sense to me because again, a cola, we're talking two percent, and this is an increase of three point eight percent, and. And if we've actually been running year over year in the 650 to 670 range, and you're asking for 725, um, I just don't know where that number comes from. I don't know why a COLA of 2% would add 3.8% to a budget that we aren't actually anticipating exhausting this year. Sir, I'm going to have to defer to finance as to why that number is the way it is. When I discussed it with them, it was assigned to the COLA. Um, this is an allocation issue because, as, as uh, Murray said, um, part of that salary's line item budget is charged to the health department. So what we can do is we can. Uh, I'm sorry, who's who's speaking? Where's the not showing up on the screen? Uh, this is Jeff Martinovich, uh, CFO. Oh, hi, Jeff. <laughs> um, we can look at that allocation just to make sure. Um, you know, when we take a look at what the charges are to the health department from OEM, what we charge the general fund, see what the overall increase is to that total salaries line, and make sure that the allocation to the general fund matches up. So we can go back and take a look at those allocations. Okay, I, I think I understand part of that was taking the 2%, not only for what we we're paying for, but what for the health department is paying for, but it all got dumped into this line item. It may have, yeah. Well, so we'll look at the allocation to see if the general fund is being charged correctly in the health department. And we'll work with Murray to shore that up a little bit. Anyone else have a question? All right, well, thank you for coming in. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. All right, uh, moving forward, is there any old business? Seeing none, is there any new business? Seeing none, without objection, we're adjourned.